Hi, today we're going to talk about two different sorts of spectroscopy, fluorescent spectroscopy, also known as fluorimetry, and Raman spectroscopy. Now there's a reason I've saved these two sorts of spectroscopy for the end, and that is because they both build upon principles that we learned as we talked about UV vis and infrared spectroscopy. So let's start off by reviewing a few concepts from UV vis and infrared spectroscopy. Remember that when we're talking about UV vis, we're talking about what happens when a photon comes in and hits one of the electrons, which then goes up to a higher energy level. And so depending on whether we're doing absorption or emission spectroscopy, we're either looking at the wavelength, which we can calculate the energy from, of that light that excites the electron, or if we're talking about emission, we're talking about the energy and therefore the wavelength of the light that is emitted as that electron goes back down to its ground state. Now, when we're talking about infrared spectroscopy, remember we were talking about a photon coming in, hitting an electron with less energy, which causes it to increase in energy, but not to the point where it can hit another orbital. And so, what it's instead going into is one of these excited vibrational states where now the molecule is vibrating, either stretching or bending in a particular way that is a higher energy state, but not as high as we were getting out of UV vis. So now we're going to talk about fluorescent spectroscopy. And with fluorescent spectroscopy, once again, we're going to talk about light coming in and hitting electrons. Now with UV vis, we were mostly talking about either absorption or emission spectroscopy. And so we'd look at either what was absorbed or what was emitted. And with fluorescence, we're doing both. And basically what it comes down to is we're putting one wavelength of light in. So that's what's being absorbed, but also then we're emitting a different wavelength of light. So that's what's being emitted. So we're looking at a combination of absorption and emission processes. And what's happening is that unlike in regular quote unquote UV vis spectroscopy, we're getting a different wavelength out than we're putting in. So how does that happen? Remember that we have these excited states where it's basically going to the next orbital up. We also have these excited vibrational states. Now that excited state the next orbital up also has vibrational states associated with it. So you can have an electron in that orbital and the molecule bending or stretching. So there's a number of different possibilities then of what can happen, where you can put an electron in, it can go to the next orbital up, that tells you how much energy you put in and therefore the wavelength of light that's going in. But as the electron goes back down in energy, it can also go down to a higher vibrational state than the original ground state it started at. And so we have a different amount of energy out, which of course corresponds to a different wavelength. So that's just one possibility. Another possibility is you start in the ground state, you put in enough energy that you go not just up to the next orbital, but up to an excited vibrational state in that next orbital. And then as the electron falls back down, it does not go all the way down to the ground state. It's still in an excited vibrational state. So that's another possibility. And again, you have different energy in than last time. So we're talking about a different wavelength. You have different energy out than last time. Here's a third possibility. You could put in enough energy to knock it up to that next orbital in an excited vibrational state. And then it could stay in that vibrational state for a while. And as it does that, some of that energy could be released as heat. And so you get what we call non radiative transition. So energy is leaving the molecule, but not in a way that we can observe. And then at some point, the electron is going to go back down to that ground state either in the very lowest ground state or in an excited vibrational state of that orbital. So when we're talking about fluorescence, we talk about these things that we call Jablonski diagrams. So basically this is something where we're looking at not just the orbitals that the electron is moving between, but also the vibrational states that it's moving between. So up till now I've shown the electron actually moving up and down, but in a Jablonski diagram, what we show is we just draw an arrow to show what is happening as the photon is absorbed. 
what state is it moving from and to. If there's non-radiative transition, you indicate that, and then you draw an arrow to show what happens as the molecule emits a photon, and this is what we call fluorescence. Now, fluorescence only works on certain sorts of molecules, and they're basically organic molecules with conjugated ring systems and minerals. So I'm going to show you every microbiologist's probably favorite fluorescent molecule. This is the thing we call DAPI. And if you've done microbiology, you may have stained with DAPI. Here's a picture of some diatoms, uh, P. tricornutum that I stained with DAPI, which I always thought was a lot of fun. And I'm dropping a link down below to some minerals that fluoresce. A lot of times when we do this sort of fluorescent stuff, like with minerals, or another thing you might think about is black light, which is ultraviolet light. So we can't see it. That's why we call it black light. Sometimes they use fluorescent stuff for hand stamps, and then they put it under the ultraviolet light, and you can see that it's there, but otherwise you can't see it. Um, that sort of stuff is all fluorescence. Okay, so how do we do fluorescent spectroscopy? First of all, you're going to find an excitation wavelength that's going to work for your analyte of interest. And then you're going to scan through what's coming out, what's being emitted, and see where you get high intensity or low intensity emission as you go across the spectrum. Now that's the way it's often done. Or the other thing you can do is you could do it the other way around fix that detector on a single wavelength, and you can imagine that there would be a monochromator involved, and then you're going to change the input wavelengths, scan across, and see which of those wavelengths cause your sample to emit at a particular frequency. Now, if you go in and you look at some of the stuff that they do with fluorescence, you may often see what we call a 3D spectrum, where they're varying both the excitation and the emission wavelengths. Um, we'll look at an example of that later. So essentially what we're looking at in the inside of fluorometer is, first you have a source, which is generating all your wavelengths. Um, and like I said, this can be UV or visible or both. Right, so you could have a tungsten source, you could have a deuterium source. Then you have an emission monochromator. So this is what is going to control the wavelengths that are going into your sample. Right, so that passes through the sample cell. And then it comes out and you have another monochromator, the excitation monochromator. And that is going to control what wavelengths you're measuring the intensity of. And then that goes to the detector. So you could see how you could scan both the emission and the excitation wavelengths by using these two monochromators. So one of the things that we have to be careful of when we're doing fluorimetry is quantum efficiency. So there are many molecules that fluoresce, but some of them fluoresce better than others. And so let's say if you have a hundred molecules capable of fluorescence, you know, maybe only five of them would actually fluoresce or maybe you know, 10 or 20 or 30 would actually fluoresce. So obviously if you're doing something like DAPI staining, where you're using that fluorescent stain to help you find something, then you want something that has a lot of fluorescing going on. And so we have this thing that we call quantum efficiency that helps us measure how many of those molecules are going to fluoresce. We determine what the quantum efficiency is using this equation. Now this, Greek letter here, which is the Greek letter phi, stands for the quantum efficiency. And over on the other side of the equation, you can see that we have these k things. Those are actually kinetic rate constants. Okay, so we have the rate constant for our non radiative transitions. Okay, how fast are those non radiative transitions going? And then the k sub f is going to be how fast the fluorescence is going. So if you have a lot of non-radiative transfers going on, then you're going to have a big number on the denominator and you're going to have a smaller quantum efficiency. And that makes a lot of sense because if the energy is leaving in ways that we can't measure, that's what non-radiative transfer means, uh, then we're not getting it as fluorescence. So there are issues with fluorescent spectrometry. The first is photobleaching, 
which is that fluorescent molecules tend to be very sensitive to light. And so as you expose them to light, those fluorescent species are going to be destroyed. And, you know, you might say, well, why not keep your sample in the dark? That's great, but, you know, the actual act of measuring fluorescence is putting light through your sample. So the longer you measure for, the lower your quantum efficiency is going to be. That's what photo bleaching is. It's basically saying your yields over time are going to go down. There's also this process that we call quenching, which is that if you have molecules in your sample that can also accept energy, sometimes the energy gets transferred from your fluorescent molecules directly to those other molecules that we call quenchers. So oxygen is a really good quencher. It loves taking energy from fluorescent species. And this is a problem because there's often a lot of oxygen anywhere. Let's say you have a sample that's dissolved in water, that water may have dissolved oxygen in it. And this also affects the quantum yield. So the more quenchers you have, the lower your quantum yield is going to be. So, you know, it's really nice to be able to eliminate quenchers if you can, but there are also methods that you can use quenching, like intentionally induce quenching, as a way to measure phenomena that are happening in your substance. And I'm not really going to get into that too much there. You can read about it in your book. So here's something that I want to show you. We environmental chemists love fluorescence for things like measuring humic acids, which are super complicated organic molecules. Uh, you can see on the y-axis of each graph, we have the excitation wavelength. So that's being varied. On the x-axis, we have the emission wavelength, which is also changing. And then this is one of those 3D graphs. So we ideally would show the intensity by going up or down. Um, but since it's really hard to do that in a print journal, what we're doing is we're showing the intensity by color. I have actually seen these printed as quasi 3D graphs, um, but they are a little hard to read. So basically in this one, we've got blue being uh, basically zero, the dark blue. We have the red being the most intense. And then there's that scale in between that you see on the top. If you look at this graph C here, let's say we're looking at 250 nanometers as our excitation wavelength. We have a big peak uh, a little past 450 nanometers. One thing you'll notice is that most of the wavelengths coming out are going to be longer wavelengths, and that means lower energy than what you're putting in. And that makes a lot of sense because usually you're losing energy along the way before you get that emission. All right, uh, now we're going to move on to Raman spectroscopy. And this is really interesting because it seems a lot like fluorescent spectrometry, but for infrared. It certainly behaves that way, but it's not for the same reasons that we were talking about for fluorescence. Okay, so infrared spectroscopy, you put a single wavelength in and some of it gets through or none of it gets through. With Ra Raman spectroscopy, you're putting a single wavelength in and then you're getting a different wavelength out. So again, th like I said, this sounds like fluorescence. The cool thing about Raman compared to infrared is that it is done primarily with lasers and you can do a lot with lasers. A lot of this is done through optical fibers. So it's a lot less bulky slash clunky compared to infrared. But you could see here, I mean, this is basically your standard spectroscopic setup where we have a source, it hits the sample, and then it goes through some sort of spectrograph where it's separating by wavelength. So that's some sort of monochromator. And that leads to a detector, which is almost always a CCD. Uh, they used to have PMTs in the olden days, but CCDs in this case are far more effective. So. As I said, this works very, very differently than fluorescence. And that's because we're not exciting electrons to different levels. We're actually changing the molecule in a fundamental way. So I want you to think back to GenChem and your intermolecular forces. And you probably remember this thing about London dispersion forces where it was an induced dipole, right? So if you have, let's say, a helium atom, which is always what I use to explain London dispersion forces to my Gen Chem students, sometimes those two electrons can both end up on one side of the molecule. And that 
instantaneous uneven distribution of electrons in the atom ends up giving us an instantaneous dipole. And so really this is what is going on when we do Raman spectroscopy. We're actually inducing instantaneous dipoles. So let's look at some of the things we can get out of Raman spectroscopy. First of all, you can put energy in and you can get the exact same energy out. That's actually most of what you get when you shine a laser on something. It's called Rayleigh scattering. And we screen that out because that's not what's interesting to us. There's what we call Stokes shift where you put the molecule into this excited state with an induced dipole and it comes back not to the ground state but to an excited vibrational state. Again, Stokes shift. Then there's what we call an anti-Stokes shift where the molecule's already in a vibrational state and it goes up to the excited electronic state of the induced dipole and then comes back down to the ground state. So you end up at a lower energy than where you started. Now, if you look at the Stokes shift in particular, you can see that the change in energy is the same as infrared absorption going up to that first vibrational state. Uh, and so these Raman peaks tend to correspond with infrared absorption peaks. So it's a very complementary technique to infrared. And you can see that here on the spectrum that shows both the infrared and Raman spectroscopy of L-cysteine. And you could see how those peaks correlate to each other. They're all at the same wave number. Now, one thing I want you to notice in particular is that if you look at this peak for the C double bond O for the carbonyl in L-cysteine, in IR we have a very strong peak. So the, it goes very deep. In Raman, we have a weak peak. And you'll notice that there is this correspondence where what's something that's a strong absorbance in IR ends up being weak in Raman. And so I want you to think about this as one of your reading questions. Why would that be the case? And we'll talk about that in class. So Raman spectroscopy is a great technique. It is complementary to infrared spectroscopy in that it can give us a lot of the same information but it also has advantages over infrared because all of the analysis is handled by fiber optic cables, which means you can do things like hook it up to a microscope or hook it up to all sorts of probes. Some of the things that you can do with Raman that you can't do with infrared, first of all, you can look at aqueous solutions, which is fantastic. The other cool thing is that you can test samples in a non-destructive fashion, so you can just scan them without having to grind them up and make them into a mole like you do with infrared spectroscopy. So between fluorescence and Raman spectroscopy, we can get a lot of information that we can't get from UV vis or infrared spectroscopy. So we have a fairly large spectroscopic toolbox for characterizing materials. And in an ideal world, you use multiple techniques to figure out what something is, what something is made of. I hope this was helpful and I will talk to you again soon.